Have you ever found yourself mindlessly matchmaking in Street Fighter 6 for hours late at night, just hoping to break that short losing streak you've been on but don't know why? Or played a secondary character that looks fun to play, but when it's in your hands, it feels sluggish and you think you just don't get it? Or how about coming back from a long day with a new fighting game in hand, booting it up, going to practice mode, and then feeling like your head goes empty as you do your best button check practice? Fighting games have long been riddled with a label that seems impossible to shake off. The games are too hard to learn, and the time it takes for meaningful improvements to occur is too high. This is then worsened by a litany of dimensions players are asked to learn. From the individual frame data, moves, to how certain combos link with each other, footsies, zoning, notations, and terms that change from game to game, the list goes on towards what seems to be infinity. Having an extensive library of fundamental words and ideas is both a blessing and a curse. It allows players to cross from one game to another and use these shared concepts to find their footing in a new fighter more easily. But it also means that new players might stumble upon certain ideas that feel intuitive for veterans, like what an O key is or the idea of plus or minus frames on block, and quickly spiral into an endless well of definitions and exceptions, not just for the game they are playing, but for other titles they may never encounter. Although the industry has gotten better about onboarding new players, there is no denying that the shadow of hard to understand games still looms over many of the games in our community. In today's video, we want to demystify the complexity of fighting games, break down the big picture ideas behind them, and illuminate the path towards small incremental improvements that should hopefully give you a sense of accomplishment as you play through these games. Before we do, however, remember to subscribe here on YouTube so you never miss one of our videos, and with Tekken 8 right around the corner, you are guaranteed to see plenty of content navigating the hardship of the most popular 3D fighter in existence. And if you're feeling generous, feel free to drop by our Patreon, where you can support us with just $1 and join these lovely people. The first hurdle most players encounter is probably the simplest at a glance. What button should you press? It's hard to convey the ideas behind frame data to players, and there's nothing more frustrating for a new player than the feeling of confusion as to why their moves are not making contact even though they feel they should. Thankfully, this has improved over the years as developers tighten up animations and visual cues that are better at communicating the actual hitboxes of these attacks. But open up any fighting game community and you are bound to come across a post showing a character's animation and their hitbox, usually with the succinct title of how. Part of the issue comes down to execution, you simply need to practice more. Sometimes you just have to get better and practicing is the only way to do that. That is often done through labbing, which is essentially going into a practice match and setting up a CPU opponent to do something in particular, be it a string of moves, jumping up, using a special move after a block, and so on. Thankfully, the vast majority of modern titles allow for this and you just grind out a particular practice, improving your reaction times as well as having a better read on opponents who try to do that specific thing. But there is a second component and one that we think might be a bigger barrier to take down. We are talking about knowledge here, specifically what you must do, which is a little harder to convey to new players. In some cases, those are pretty straightforward. For example, in Mortal Kombat 1, all characters have at least two anti-air moves. They're down three and standing one. Some will have a few more, maybe a special two, but you can safely use either of those normals to punish an opponent coming from above the vast majority of the time. But this is the best case scenario. As you go deeper into a fighting game's core gameplay, this gets worse at least from the player's perspective. It's like trying to learn a new language by only knowing a few words. You still need to learn the grammar and especially the exceptions eventually. This is a topic that, for the broader gaming industry, has been a major point of discussion between developers and players. Learning how to play a video game, especially a fighting game, is not linear. You don't get better by putting in more time you get better by understanding the things that you're not good at. Most fighting games assume players will go through the tutorial and successfully internalize the lessons in each step by the time the next one comes up. This is how you end up with games with dozens of tutorial steps, each with multiple blocks of text explaining how they work. Yet once players are out of them, they might feel even more lost than before. Speaking of feeling lost, if you want something to help complement those tutorials, you can check out our pro player guides here on YouTube and on our website at dashfight.com. First person shooters don't feel the need to explain how jiggle peeking or slicing the pie works in their games, and if those two terms just caught you off as a fighting game player, congratulations. 
Now you know how a new player feels when a game pops up a message talking about startup, action, and recovery frames, or tries to explain to players how certain moves allow them to have an option select. One idea that has floated around, including by FGC and Rocket League commentator Damascus, is to make use of AI or, at the very least, personalized systems to create a more targeted tutorial experience. The gist of it goes that the game should give players free reign from the start and ask very little from them when it comes to knowledge at first. Instead, allow them to play, and once patterns begin to emerge, like players struggling to block low moves, failing to input a quarter circle special multiple times, or failing to punish a gap in a combo, then the game steps up and, one, communicates what the player might be doing wrong or the information they might be missing, and, two, creates a practice environment made exactly for that scenario. This helps alleviate the core issue of inexperienced players needing more tools and knowledge to identify their own weaknesses. In a way, Tekken 8's ghost mode could be a first step. A CPU mimicking your playstyle might be enough to see what you lack from the opposite side of the equation. Unfortunately, another element that causes players to fall off from sticking in fighting games is the sense that unless they are good, the game is not worth playing. Plenty of people heard their friends be really interested in trying out Street Fighter 6, Mortal Kombat 1, or Tekken 8, only to immediately follow up their excitement with, but I know I won't be good at it, and then don't actually play through the game. This is a difficult area for developers to manage. Obviously, dumbing down the system is not an ideal solution, as it alienates the hardcore audience, the one that will stick around for the long run, show up at majors, and potentially highlight the best part of a game's mechanical depth. Some developers have opted to use single player as a mode to simply build up a player's confidence in their abilities. Street Fighter VI's World Tour mode provides a leveling experience in an open world and challenges in many games that help players practice some of the game's less intuitive systems. Mortal Kombat 1 has both a single player story mode that can be played at different difficulties and a seasonal mode that, well, you can watch our other video on invasions to get a full picture. Suffice it to say, it misses the mark. Leading us with Tekken 8 and its potentially gripping story mode, though whether that will serve as a jumping off point for players to feel somewhat more confident is yet to be decided. Ultimately, the amount of pressure a person feels is hard to account for. So if you're just starting out in fighting games, don't get so tangled up with the specifics. Play through the single player, then spend some time labbing in the game's practice mode. The final piece of the puzzle is that, well, sometimes it's hard to find the fun in losing, especially after you get into a particularly bad run of form. We've spoken about this in the past too, and how all players benefit from learning how to lose and why it's important to lose. We won't repeat ourselves too much here and just stick to the fact that many fighting games struggle to give players a sense of progression even after a loss. The idea that the struggle itself is part of the fun might work for From Software games and their derivatives, but at least on those, if a player feels entirely underpowered, they can take a break and grind away from the bosses. In fighting games, you rarely get an easy fight or a tangible objective goal to strive for, even in losses. Learning to lose and giving losses a purpose can sometimes feel like accepting defeat before the match even happens, but it also means letting go of your worries about where you might rank and instead refocusing your practice around specific goals. Although the barriers around the fighting game community can look tall, they are not impassable and we've seen a huge amount of effort by not just developers, but communities to dismantle them. With all that work, it's important to remember that sometimes making games overwhelmingly transparent with frame data, for example, can also lead to player fatigue and people freezing up when given so many ways to analyze their gameplay. Sometimes less is more. And that's it for today's video. Thank you so much for watching, we appreciate it. Let us know what you think makes fighting games hard in the comments below, and be sure to drop a like if you enjoyed the video. Thank you, and we'll see you in the next one.